In this episode, we're going to show you how to determine the length of your link bars, what to make them out of, how to make them, and what bar ends to use. All that starting right now. Hey Garage Fabbers, I'm Man Candy, owner of Man Candy's Creations, and in previous episodes, we built a cross member and tabs for the upper link bars of the Mighty Max. I'm reusing the lower bars the original builder made to save some time, and since I'm building a parallel four link, all the bars should be exactly the same length to keep pinion angle constant. That means my bar length is already decided for me. If it seems I'm speaking gibberish, be sure to check out my suspension basics playlist. Most of you will have to determine the length of your link bars. So let's talk about the order that I do things, which makes it really easy to figure things out. Hopefully you're watching this when your vehicle is still fully assembled with factory suspension installed. Before doing anything, you need to mark the location of the axle on your frame. You can do this with a plumb bob on a perfectly level surface, but a more accurate and forgiving method is with a large T-square. Now put your vehicle on a flat surface. A slanted driveway is okay as long as it's straight. In other words, it can't be curved or wavy, and it can't be dirt, gravel, or grass. If that's what you're working with, use the plumb bob method, but only if the vehicle is perfectly level. Plant the T-square firmly on the ground with the upright against the axle and mark the frame on the edge that's touching the axle. Do that again on the other side of the axle. If your surface is straight, you will have two marks that match the diameter of your axle tube. Split this distance in half and you have the center of the factory axle location. Step back and confirm that your rear wheel is centered in the wheel opening. It should be, but if it's not, take note of which direction it needs to move and about how much. Also, make sure both sides are the same. On trucks, I prefer to measure from the back of the cab. I once built utility trucks for a living and I learned that frame holes, rivets, and shock mounts aren't always exact and can't be trusted to use as measuring points. Honestly, the cab isn't super accurate either, but unless you have a precision frame table, you're gonna have to embrace close enough. You can build a perfect chassis and you can build a chassis in your driveway, but it's incredibly difficult to build a perfect chassis in your driveway. After confirming your axle marks on both sides are equal, make them permanent. You need these markings to position a frame notch determine your link bar length, and confirm the axle is in the correct location after everything is assembled. Side note there, my notch was done by the previous owner, so I don't need to do it. And the next Garage Fab project, yet to be announced, won't require a notch at all. So that leaves a huge hole in this channel, and it drives me crazy. I'm hoping I can find someone that needs a frame notch after my wife's truck is done, just so I can make that video. Until then, please go check out a fellow YouTuber. Jake with Rody Fab has an incredible channel that keeps getting better. And best of all, he's got a brilliant video on measuring for a C-notch. I'll leave a link in the description and the comments below. Go check it out and let him know Garage Fab sent you. Something you need to decide is when you want your rear wheel to be centered in the wheel opening. When attached to link bars, your axle will move on an arc. As the bars swing towards parallel with the ground, your axle will be pushed backwards some. And as the bars swing away from parallel with the ground, the axle will pull forward, assuming you're not building a reverse forelink. If you need clarification on that, check out Suspension Basics Episode 1. That said, is it more important to you that your back wheel is centered while driving down the street or while laid out at a car show? This decision is nothing more than preference. The slight change in wheelbase isn't enough to affect vehicle handling. I personally want the rear wheels centered when parked. The small amount of off-centeredness would be harder to notice when the vehicle is in motion. Now that the rear axle position is marked, you can begin construction. I start with the front cross member pushed as far forward as possible. The further forward the cross member is, the longer your link bars will be. The longer your link bars are, the better match they will be to your drive shaft, requiring less movement of the drive shaft slip yoke. We'll talk more about that in a suspension basics video I'm working on called Third Links. Hit the subscribe button and the notification bell for that one. With the cross member in place and the link bar tabs attached, we can now make some rough measurements. I apologize in advance for any weirdness in this next section. 
I was under anesthesia a couple hours ago while having a camera shoved down my throat and I still feel a little... weird. Now that the axle position front to back is determined, I want to temporarily mount the axle in that location. I want to show you the way I do that, which allows me to move the axle vertically and lock it into any position I need. Drugs. Using the marks I created with the T-square, I'm going to temporarily tack weld two pieces of flat stock to the frame vertically. Make sure the two strips are spaced out exactly the diameter of the axle tube at the top and the bottom. No more, no less. The point to this is that the axle can move freely up and down, but it is essentially locked in the center of the wheel opening. Drugs. Since I've decided the wheel should be centered in the wheel opening when the truck is laid out, we need to find out where to vertically position the axle within this track. To do that, there's a bit of math involved. First, to determine the height the axle will be in with the rims and tires installed. The total diameter of the wheels I'm using is 26 inches, half of which is 13 inches. That's the center of the wheel and therefore is also the height of the center of the axle. Now let's find out where in relation to the chassis the axle will be when laid out. More math. With the suspension fully deflated, the bottom of the frame will rest on the ground but currently it's on jack stands 16 inches above the ground. That said, we need to include that 16 inches in our measurements. So if the wheels put the axle 13 inches off the ground, which is also the bottom of the frame, and we add 16 inches for the jack stands, that gives us 29 inches total. This is where the axle will be centered. I'm going to attach another piece of metal across to hold the axle at that height while building the rest of the suspension. One final calculation is required for that. We know where the center of the axle should be, but since the axle will be resting on this piece of metal, we have to take away half the diameter of the axle tube. The total diameter is two and three quarters inches, so half that is one and three eighths inches. If we drop our center line down that much, we have the height of our axle rest. Let's put the axle in and start the fun stuff. This is an adapter I made for my jack to help position an axle when I'm by myself. It's not super complex, but if you want a video on it, let me know in the comments. I built a similar thing when I was building utility trucks that would lift heavy steel bumpers for a one-man install. Something that would usually take three guys to do. They fired me. With the axle in place, let's take some measurements and see how long our link bars will be. From the center of the front link bar tab mounting holes to the center of the axle is 28 and a half inches. This would be the length of your link bars. Let's compare that measurement to the lower link bars that the original builder made. 28 and 1 8 inches. That's a 3 8 inch difference, but that's okay. We can take that into consideration when we design and install the link bar tabs for the axle in the next video. I'm going to start making the link bars by first creating a link bar jig. The jig will allow you to make all the link bars exactly the same while ensuring all the bushings are oriented properly. It's not as complicated as it may sound. A link bar jig is simply some square tubing or angle iron with holes in it. The holes should be exactly the size of your bushing through bolts spaced out to your desired link bar length. I should probably clarify in case you haven't already figured it out, a link bar's length is measured from the center of one link bar end to the center of the opposite end. Now that the holes are drilled, you need to bolt your bar ends in place. I introduced mock-up bushings in the last video while installing link bar tabs. I said they weren't required then, but now they are. The mock-up bushings are stunt doubles for the polyurethane bushings, so you can weld all you want without melting stuff. Click the link for the Thorbro site in the description to check them out. Still not sponsored, but still cool, so go get you some. I wanna talk briefly about link bar ends, very briefly. I think I'll do a video specifically on suspension bushings and proper install in the future, but right now we're making link bars, so I better at least talk about our options. The most commonly used bar ends are rubber, polyurethane, and heim joints. Which one should you choose? I don't know. That's something you're gonna to have to answer for yourself because it really depends on what you plan to use the vehicle for. Rubber is the softest bushing available, which absorbs a lot of road vibration, giving a more luxurious ride. It's also cheap. 
Rubber doesn't last long though, especially when pushed to its limits like in off-road or adjustable height suspensions. And the softness isn't great for performance steering and handling. So if you have a static height daily driver, rubber is an acceptable option. Polyurethane is a soft plastic that's stiffer than rubber and far more durable, making it a great choice for race cars, adjustable height vehicles, and mild off-road applications. Multiple hardnesses are available so you can choose between comfort and performance. Polyurethane is also really affordable and easy to work with. Heim joints, much less affordable. For a single Heim joint capable of handling the job of a link bar end, you're looking at around 50 bucks at the time this video was made. There's eight bar ends in a triangulated four link, so that's more than most people wanna spend. Luckily, they're not required for most of us. Those that should really consider Heim joints are builders of race cars, serious off-road vehicles, rock crawlers, or anything that requires a lot of suspension articulation. Articulation is the uneven motion of the suspension components over rocks or when the body rolls. When the axle twists, so do the link bars. Polyurethane bushings resist this twisting motion and this resistance increases as the material compresses until it stops the motion completely. That limits the total angle to around five to 10 degrees, depending on the softness of the polyurethane. Each Heim has up to about 30 degrees of unrestricted motion on its own and roughly 45 degrees with misalignment spacers. And since there's two Heims on each link bar, together the Heims will allow the axle to twist as much as 90 degrees. In case you're not visualizing that, 90 degrees would be your axle sitting on its side. Crazy movement, but it comes at a price. Heims do not dampen vibration, like at all. So unless you wanna feel every crack and pebble on the road, avoid the Heim. There is a caveat there though. We're not building an adjustable link bar today, but if you do, you must use at least one Heim joint. This is a link bar the original builder installed on this truck. This is a no-no. When you have a polyurethane bushing at both ends and your suspension twists, I don't care how tight your lock nut is, the resistance of the polyurethane bushings will cause this adjustment to eventually loosen. Guess what? These bars were always loose. Garbage. A single Heim joint in an adjustable link bar will allow some unrestricted movement during normal driving, so your adjustment stays tight while the polyurethane end soaks up a little road vibration. I saved the best for last. One day, a polyurethane bushing and a Heim joint did the nasty and created a Johnny joint. My favorite bar end. Don't buy them. What? They are super cool, but also stupid expensive. And the truth is, you probably don't need them. A Johnny joint has a ball pivot like a Heim, but rather than a thin layer of Teflon, the ball is encased in polyurethane. So you get all the freedom of movement of a Heim while keeping decent ride quality. You might consider Johnny joints if you have a hardcore off-road Jeep that's also a daily driver, or if you're rich and you don't wanna be. With the bar ends locked into place, we've got all kinds of options for the link bar itself. You can use round tubing or square tubing. You can put square tubing in angled to create a diamond. Using a straight piece of tubing is obvious, but you can also use tubing with a curve or an S shape. You can also build a link bar out of plate. Assuming it's structurally sound and the bar ends are positioned properly, it doesn't matter what shape the link bar is. I created an entire video on crazy shaped link bars that I highly recommend. Go check it out and tell me what you think. It also doesn't matter what the link bar is made out of, as long as it doesn't bend or break. I prefer mild steel or DOM tubing. I've been told I should be using chromoly tubing for link bars, but I don't, and I won't. Mostly because I don't understand the topic fully, and not because I haven't tried. I have literally spent days researching the mild steel versus chromoly debate. The problem is I can't find a group of smart people that agree. So here's some of the information that I have that has brought me to the decision to use mild steel. Starting with the misconception that chromoly is lighter than mild steel, it is not. A piece of chromoly and an equal size piece of mild steel weigh exactly the same amount. Chromoly is stronger than mild steel, which allows you to use less material without compromising strength, and therefore your project as a whole would be lighter. Hashtag race car. Here's what you need to know about chromoly. 
Chromoly needs to be welded in a very specific manner, which includes preheating, strict temperature control while welding using a TIG welder, and heat treating your part afterwards. Doing any or all of this incorrectly will likely lead to parts breaking at or near the weld site. So let's talk briefly about what a part failure looks like with both materials. If a mild steel link bar is overloaded, it will most likely bend under the stress. This is gonna suck. It's going to throw your alignment out, potentially chewing up tires, or cause your vehicle to track all kinds of wonky. Whatever it is, depending on the severity of the bend, you might need to tow your car home. A chromoly failure, on the other hand, will likely take the form of a sudden breakage. Any suspension components completely giving way, especially in the rear at speed, can have really unfortunate consequences. If you are not capable of welding chromoly properly, consider sticking with a more forgiving material. The worst reason in the world to do something is because you haven't had any problems with it yet. But I haven't had any problems with mild steel links yet, so we need to notch or fish mouth a piece of mild steel tubing twice so that it'll fit between these two bar ends. Here's how I do that. Measure the space between the outsides of the bushings and write it down. Cutting tubing to this length will leave us with gaps on the outsides of the bar ends. Instead, this measurement will be the distance between the notch throats. We need to add a little material to that measurement to create the, uh, the lips of the fish mouth. When notching a pipe to fit the same sized pipe, the notch depth will be about one quarter the diameter of the tube. So one quarter of the one and a half tubing I'm using is three eighths of an inch. Three eighths is the notch depth or in this case, the height of the fish lips. So add this to your measurement, twice, because there's two notches. This is the measurement you'll cut your tubing to. Once that's done, draw a line across the length of the tubing to help orient the notches. Go check out my video on tube notching and then notch both ends. Heads up, when you're done notching, your tube probably won't fit between the bushings yet. You just notch the tubing to fit the same size tubing. Bar ends generally have a larger diameter than what you would typically use for a link bar, so your notch will be a wee bit too small. That was intentional. It'll just take a few seconds to open up the notch to fit. Work slow. I'd love to demonstrate, but I'm not using straight bars. My upper bars need to curve around my air springs, so most of the stuff we just talked about won't work for me. I am honestly not sure how I'm going to go about making them, so I can't explain in advance. Instead, I'm just gonna wing it. It looks like the bars will need to be about 31 inches before bending. I've got no clue what the angle of the bend will need to be, but I'm hoping I can create some sort of template with some TIG fill rod. So there's my angle. The plan is to cut a piece of tubing intentionally too long, slap it in the bender to match this thingy, and then trim it to fit in the jig. Now that the bars are bent, I gotta figure out where to cut the notches. I'm not sure yet how I'm going to do that either, but I do know I want the notches to be clocked the same, so I'm gonna lay the tubing down flat and draw a line halfway up on both ends and both sides. These marks will be the center of the notch throats. Cutting this tube to length will be weird because we're not measuring the entire length of the tube itself, but the cross section between the bushings. And the ends won't be cut to 90 degrees, but some unknown angle. So here's how I plan to figure things out. To start, I'm gonna hold the bar in place to make sure it clears the air spring and mark about where the cuts will be. Then on a piece of square tubing, I'll put the actual length the tube needs to be and stack the two pieces lining up the marks the best I can. Now I'll transfer the marks from the square tubing to my workpiece. This is where the tube will be cut, but I still don't know the angle. So using the marks on the square tubing, I'll use a square to mark the actual cut lines. I'm not going to cut directly on the lines though. Nothing about this method has been precision so far, so I wanna make sure I don't cut it too short. I'd rather have to trim a little than throw it away and start over. 
The notches will be a bit strange too, since I still don't know the actual angles I'm working with. So I'm just going to pick one of my notch templates that's close, but leaves me with some extra material to trim. Don't forget to bevel the notches before welding. The upper link bars are ready to roll. Now we need to create some more tabs for the axle. Those are a bit more complicated than the front tabs, but we'll cover it in the next video. Until then, my friends, keep moving forward.